the the major reason why it's hard to work on the ZCC is that the leadership and the membership kind of have an agreement that they won't really talk to you or they'll talk to you and they'll be nice, but they won't really talk to you. So they, they generally speaking, the ZCC regards its own theology and practice as kind of being secret. And then you have to be a member to talk about it. Yes, everyone, welcome to the channel. Today we'll be talking about the Panyane and the early ZCC Church. Mm -hmm. Interesting, right? This will be a three-part series. Today being part one, we'll simply look at the early lives of the Panyane, his surroundings, challenges, and uh, stuff like that. So do stick around till the end. Without any further ado, as you can see that uh, I'm not alone. I do have a very special guest with me, Dr. Barry Morton. Are you well enough? Hi, how are you? I'm, hey, great. I'm, doing I'm good. great, how are you, I'm great, Percy? I'm great, I'm great. Uh, before we get into the video, I have to admit one thing. It was so hard for me to get hold of you. I called you, Nisa. They said, nope, you were nowhere to be found. <laughs> I then decided to checking your linkedin accounts your facebook instagram twitter nope you were nowhere to be found but i'm glad you finally here and you have uh, managed to sacrifice some time so that you could be with us uh, i really do appreciate your presence and Thanks, uh, man. hopefully our guests do appreciate you being on the on the channel so since there's not so much information about you uh, on the internet, you have written a lot about other people and uh, basically like the South African uh, church history. But then when you get to look at your life, there's not so much on that. So with that, may you kindly please tell us about yourself, your background, where you've been and what makes you sort of like an expert when it comes to the history of the Hanyane and the Elis XCC. Yeah, well... Um... I mean, I'm American, as you can tell from my accent, but I actually grew up in Southern Africa. Um, I grew up in uh, Botswana mainly, and I actually went to school in SA in Zimbabwe as well. So I, I have a long history uh, with, the, with the area. I know it really well. And then when I got older, uh, I got a PhD in, in African history, and I've, I've been writing about uh, Southern African history for almost 30 years now. Uh, I worked at uh, what was then called uh, the University of Natal Durban for a while. I was associated with UNISA for quite a while, um, although I'm not anymore and I, I still live it here in the U.S. So I guess, I guess you could say that I, I keep writing about history just for my own personal creative purposes, although I used to do it professionally. So regarding family, how does that look like? Family? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not quite. I mean, my parents still live in Botswana, um, but I, I live and work here in, in Indianapolis. Um, so, so when did you leave uh, Africa? When, I don't know if I've ever left it. Uh, I I went. I left to go to university in in like 1985, and and then I I was working a lot in in uh, Southern Africa in the 90s. I was I had various jobs and various contracts, but I've pretty much lived in the U.S. since about 2000. Although, you know, I I, I, I have been back a lot. 2013 to 2019, I was in Southern Africa on various projects a lot. So yes, Dr. Barry Morton has done a lot of research and writings regarding the Hanyane and the LZCC Church. So if you want to get some taste of uh, his best work, I recommend this book. As you can see the author there. I'll leave a link in the description. So you should know there's not going to be 
any discount if you use the link in the description. The book will probably cost you like a 300 rent. So yes, take that 350 and purchase this 300 book. You'll be left with 50 rent. So yeah, that's, that's wise. Do get the material. It's worth it. Yeah, Dr. Very much on, as I was reading, uh, your work and other people who have written on this, uh, subject of Agnes Lekhanyane, such as, uh, Hosi Libote, you, 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 you tend to agree on this thing that it is very difficult for a non-member to conduct a successful research on the church. So could you please tell us from your experience, why is this, you know, uh, you seem like someone who has gathered a lot of information more than many people and organizations. Tell us about the challenges, difficulties that you have uh, encountered while you were trying to acquire as much information as you could regarding the topic that we're discussing today. Well, I mean, the, the, the major reason why it's hard to work on the ZCC is that the leadership and the membership kind of have an agreement that they won't really talk to you. Or they'll talk to you and they'll be nice, but they won't really talk to you. So they, they, generally speaking, the ZCC regards its own theology and practice as kind of being secret, and then you have to be a member to talk about it honestly. So that's one thing. You know, that's one reason. Um, another, another thing is, is the um, Enginus Lechanyani, uh, I don't believe that he had ever had a single word written in print about him while he was alive, which is pretty astonishing because uh, most African ministers of his era were in the newspaper constantly, but he was never even mentioned once in print while he was alive. So he refused interviews from a number of people. He refused um, to allow scholars to look at him or to investigate his church while he was alive. And although that was re that restriction was lifted by his successors to some extent, once they got that publicity, they clamped down again because they didn't like some of the things that were being written about them. So. These are two major reasons why it's very hard to get information. And there's a host of other more minor reasons as well in, uh, that would affect a professional historian finding information as well, which I don't think I want to go into because they're hard to explain. But there's also a number of other inhibiting factors. So you have to be very creative and you have to be very disciplined and you have to search places that your instincts tell you to go in order to find information. And, you know, but I, I was confident when I started, I would find them. And, and, you know, I, I believe that I did about as well as I expected to. Today's video is sponsored by the Bible. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation the dooms of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here too, heaven is opened and the gates of hell disclose. Christ, Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It shall fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be open at the judgment, be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. When did the life of 
Lepanyene is that who were his parents? Uh, could you also touch on how his early childhood was like? Was he really born in the sacred mount of uh, Tabahobo? And did he, was he born and did he grow up within the Mamabolo chieftaincy? Yeah, well, I, I think the first 10 years of, of Enchinas's life, he was probably fairly, lived a comfortable peasant existence. But in, when he was 10, I think he went through a terrible, terrible time. Uh, not only him, but all the Africans around him went through terrible times. Um, so he had a very, his teenagehood would have been very traumatic. So the, the first thing that happened is that his, the chief or the, the unrecognized chief that his family followed was not given a location or a homeland or a reserve by the government. And this put them in a real problem because they had nowhere to live. Um, so the, the chief, or not really a chief, the unrecognized chief, Jacob Mamabola, was forced to go and make deals with farmers about where they could live. So they had to move constantly. And then about this, while they were moving around, uh, this disease called Rinderpest hit which killed basically over 90% of all cattle and livestock. And also wild animals died as well. So that made hunting difficult because all the game was, you know, all the, all the uh, spring box would die, etc. you know. So it became hard to hunt. The cattle died. And then this was followed by two terrible years of drought. Um, and the combined hunger and the combined hunger and drought was then led to serious outbreaks of disease going on. So there were all kinds of uh, plagues going on, malaria, smallpox, you name it. So serious hunger, serious disease, being forced to move from where you'd grown up with no real land tenure, no security. This was, this is what he was forced into as a, as a young man. And then, um, and then after that, then the South African war breaks out in 1899, which was even more problematic for, uh, the Mama Bolo as well as, uh, Engenes's, uh, group. Um, the, the, the Transvaal government stole whatever food they had. They forced them to provide, you know, free labor. Basically it was a kind of slavery. you They'd show up, force you to build armaments and take your food, et cetera, et cetera. And then the Mama Bolo decided to make a deal with some farmers whose farms were now kind of devastated in the action. So they went to live at Turfluip, a farm that is now the University of Limpopo. And so Enchinus spent about four years on this Turfluip farm during the war and when the hostilities and all this terrible times were over the farmers who owned this land the the farmers who lived in Joburg had the government steal all of or impound all the cattle that belonged to this group so Enginus's uh, father's cattle were taken along with all the other cattle all their wealth was taken because allegedly they hadn't paid rent, okay? And so they were forced to go to the Transvaal Supreme Court to get their cattle back, which they, against all odds, succeeded in getting their animals back several years later. But that still left them with the same problem. They got their cattle back, but where are they supposed to live? Because obviously those farmers kicked them out if, you, if you're having a court case. So let's just say that from the time Enginus was 10 to 18, that he, he and his family lived a highly precarious, poor existence, full of uncertainty and devastation. Um, and the, the only way they recovered was that this government official who 
actually impounded their cattle, took kind of pity on them, and he put them on a farm right next to the Mama Bola Reserve without telling anybody, like he did it without permission from his superiors. And he kept that secret for about 15 years from the Transvaal government. So Enchinus's family, about 1904, 1905, get their cattle back, and they get put on this farm in a highly secretive arrangement. And, right, and that puts him within a kilometer of Mount Tabahone, right on the border. And then from that time on, his family seemed to be very secure. Um, as he heads on in, as he's now paying taxes for the first time, he's now 18. So as an adult, finally, he gains some security. So like, during this period of suffering, tribulations, and more like external persecution, uh, what, what kind of education, truth, and uh, He had no education. He didn't. Uh, he wasn't educated then. He only got educated once. He got put on a farm, this farm right next to the Mama Bolo Reserve, literally right on the fence. And then at the age of 18, 19, he went to school for about three years, walking into the reserve. And he went to this small Presbyterian school, which was run by a, an educated uh, woman from the trans sky uh, called Annie Machlentle. And that's where he gained whatever education he had about three years um, of primary school. Um, we don't know too much about that time, but he could clearly read and write, although he didn't write much down himself ever. Um, but, and he could speak English and Afrikaans, so I, I assume some of that came from that Presbyterian school. Yeah, and then... Uh... Within your book, it is mentioned that uh, his parents were Christians, and then uh, also you have uh, kind of like uh, tipped on it that they were like uh, kind of mission missionaries, Presbyterians, and were there also like other missionaries during that time? And uh, what influence did they have on uh, the young Agnes Lehanyane? And did they help him to embrace Christianity? Which, which time did you really, like, embrace Christianity? All right. Well, it, it really appears that Enginus was first baptized when he was attending this Presbyterian school when he was about 1920, and his parents only joined the church at that time. However, the Mama Bolo area was a real religious hotbed, and so there was a very strong Lutheran presence and then an Anglican presence, and if you look at the baptism records, Enginus's relatives belong to all these churches. You know, they, they had joined Lutherans very early on, and many of them were Presbyterians. And then later, uh, many others became Anglican as well. But Enginus himself does not appear to have been that religious during his education, although he was baptized as a Presbyterian. The, his, his, the people who grew up with him said that he wasn't. So it doesn't really appear until he left um, to start in migrant labor that he was that religious. Yeah, and then uh, with that, him leaving uh, the Transvaal to go to Boxpec as a migrant labor, which was around the 1910s. By this time, already he has some Christian theology practices within him, probably you know aligning more with the missionaries that were present. Uh, you mentioned the Lutherans, Anglican, and Presbyterian. But then, however, in Boxback, he comes across faith mission. I just want to know, and I think it might be helpful for the viewers also, just to get an understanding of how did the AFM get to South Africa and how different was it from the more Protestant, uh, such as the Lutheran, Anglican, and Presbyterian? Um, also, within that, uh, how was Agnes' perspective 
uh, perception when he encountered the AFM, the relationship that he developed with them. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the apostolic faith mission, which is mainly an offer Connor church today, was much different when it first started. Um, it basically came out of uh, Los Angeles in the United States when the Pentecostal church first emerged. It, was, it started off in 1906 or so, and it spread rapidly across the world. Um, so apostolic faith mission or the, the early Pentecostals, um, they believed heavily in the book of Acts, and they, they wanted to incorporate in their, in their uh, church practices things like faith healing, speaking in tongues. They wanted to see people with religious power creating miracles to help ordinary people in their problems. Okay? They didn't, they were much more, um, their services were much more dramatic um, and emotional than, let's say, the Lutherans or Presbyterians who would just sit there and listen to the, you know, the Maruti talk for, for 90 minutes, you know, and then sing hymns from the hymnal. You know what I'm saying? These yeah, were people yeah. who would sing, you know, just they would sing by heart and they would adapt the song and, and, and their preaching was more emotional, less focused on the Bible and reading verse X. It was more hard-hitting stuff combined with faith healing, speaking in tongues. And so there were these very dramatic ceremonies. And when American missionaries came to South Africa, they brought this emotional preaching and it had quite a, a major impact amongst Afrikaners uh, and especially in the Free State and the Transvaal, it was very successful amongst Africans as well. So um, Engineus obviously, found Protestantism boring, but he was highly attracted to the AFM when it emerged, just like many other, but like thousands of other people his age were. Um, and, you know, he when, he when he went to work as a migrant laborer to earn money for his labola and his taxes, he went to Boxburg and he he was baptized in the AFM by an African preacher. Um, so I, I don't think his story in that regard is that unusual, at least for religious people of his time. Yeah, so we, we, within, within that, uh, there's, there's three people whom I would like you to just give us a picture of who they are and uh, uh, there's, there's people being Daniel Konyane, Elias Matang, and Edward Lyon. Uh, I think those men might have shaped Lihanyane quite uh, so much. So who are these men? Uh, what did they believe? And uh, why were they so influential, not only to Lihanyane, but to South Africa, you know, as a whole? Yes. Um, Engineus Lihanyane was definitely shaped by three... African leaders in the AFM who went off and formed their own churches. And he knew two of them really well and didn't know the other. But it's obvious that these were the people who got him thinking about doing or about forming his own movement. So Daniel Nkonyani is highly interesting because I don't believe Enginus ever met him. Um, but... Nkonyani was basically, one, he was the first South African to have his own Zion, you know, this, the concept of a kind of a religious refuge. And so it's obvious that Enginus found out and knew a lot about Nkonyani, although I don't, I'm sure he didn't meet him or there's no reference at all to it. And so the thing about Nkonyani was that he, he was in this uh, town in the southern Transvaal called Wackerstrom, which was a real, like the Mama Bolo Reserve, a real religious hotbed. And when the white pastor 
of the AFM moved to Joburg, Unkonyani took over this congregation. And he turned it from a non-racial group into an explicitly racial church. And so he began to refusing to pay taxes, uh, refusing to follow the past laws, refusing to listen to anything the government told him. Uh, he carried around a huge wooden staff and he would heal people with it or he'd threaten his enemies with lightning or to make stones fall on them and kill them, etc. And he was eventually, he was soon expelled from the AFM by the white leadership, but he was able to get the money to buy his own farm just across the border in Natal, where he had the first Zion in South Africa. And so that example, I, I'm sure of it, inspired Lekanyani because the, the individual who baptized him in Boxburg was a close associate of Nkonyani. That was Elias Mahlangu. And Mahlangu had been a really close friend of Nkonyani, but had not joined his breakaway church. And he preferred to stay with the AFM, who moved him to Boxburg to preach. So Elias Mahlangu actually was calling himself Elias Nkonyani while he was in Boxburg. And 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 Lekanyani then became a very important member of the Boxburg Church, AFM Church, and then later preached under Mahlangu as he in turn broke away from the AFM. So I think that's the connection between Nkonyani and Lechanyani. It's more through the intermediary um, and the example of the first Zion. Yeah, and uh, this relationship or uh, admiration of uh, Agnes Lechanyani to Elias Matang and Edward L uh, Lyon didn't last forever. There was a time where, you know, uh, the bonds did break. Just uh, could you please explain to us what went wrong there what happened let, let me let me jump back I, i'm sorry i forgot i forgot to talk about edward lyon as well oh, yes, yes. um the second person to form a zion in southern africa was edward lyon who was actually a musutu who lived in boxburg while engineus was there working for the afm and then who was sent to Basutu land or Lesotho to go and run the AFM in, in, in that country. And so in 1920, after eight years of being the AFM leader in Basutu land, Lyon was given by a chief who he had converted, he was given a big piece of land at a place called Kolonyama. And so at that point, Lyon declared his own independence from the AFM and he began his own Zion at Kolonyama. Okay, so again, this is a third after Mathlangu leaves AFM, Lekanyani moves with him, becomes a preacher there for the first time. And then when Lyon leaves the AFM and starts his own Zion, Lekanyani then becomes the Transvaal bishop wasn't really the word they used or he became the transvaal leader of lyon's church which was called zion apostolic faith mission but which everybody called five mission because they can't pronounce the word faith so lekanyani was head of five mission in the transvaal where for the first time he became really successful and he he converted more people in the transvaal really then Lyon had recruited elsewhere in the organization. Uh, and so that this is when I think Lekanyani gets the idea for the, maybe not for the first time, but he, he sees that it becomes feasible for himself now to form his own movement. You know why I'm displaying this. So Dalawa, you must. <laughs>